Now we have a film. When I was 19 years old, I broke up with my boyfriend of two years. Five months after the breakup, I got a text from a random number saying that they had seen me on Pornhub. He was my first boyfriend, my first sexual experience, first everything. He one time took a photo of me in my underwear and bra, and I immediately was like, delete that. He said, why? It's just for me. I'm your boyfriend. I'm never going to share it with anyone. And then eventually sending pictures became a normal part of our relationship. And it became a really fun way to express my sexuality and to share that with him. It was only when I broke up with him, he began stalking me for months just to get me to keep talking to him. When none of that worked, he started threatening me with my naked pictures. It was February 26, 2015, and I got a text from a random person saying that they had seen me on Pornhub. That's when I found a Pornhub profile made with my name, my address, my phone number, eight of my naked pictures that I had sent to my ex-boyfriend. As we see, it's so common for women to have our sexuality weaponized against us. I realized that that's what he was doing. Although at the time, it was just pure panic, like what do I do? My town judge told me that when you send naked pictures to one person, it's like asking for them to be put on a billboard. So I was being victim blamed within the first hour of finding my naked pictures on the internet. My family, John Kerry Goldberg, who is today my boss, but back then became my lawyer, when I did meet Carrie, the first thing she said to me was, I just want you to know this isn't your fault. It was the first time anyone ever said that to me. <laughs> so now I'm the client relations manager here. I've met with hundreds of survivors of tech facilitated abuse and, and other sex crimes. At the end of the day, I'm not going to tell people not to send naked pictures. What I will say is you should know your rights if the consent is violated. Just because you took naked pictures doesn't mean you deserve to have them out there. You can do everything possible to try to protect yourself. To let go of the shame externally placed on victims of sex crimes, to realize that it's not my shame to carry forward. And now my friends, I have the pleasure and the urgent need to introduce you to Natasha, Natalia Kanem, Executive Director of the United Nations Population Fund, which works globally on furthering women's self-determination. Natalia, the floor is yours. And I have to say, I'm very honored that you are here. You have a strong message, and you, uh, it's really, it's important. Thank you. Thank you so much for Should I inviting this, us. This, this here? Yeah? Good. Okay. Look, I'm delighted to be here. It's my first DLD, and I now know what the excitement is all about. I've had so many inspiring conversations starting last night when I came in. So thank you for welcoming the United Nations. We do stand for peace. And peace in your home and your heart is part of that global peace that we all aspire to. So I'm really happy. Thank you again, Steffi, for inviting me. I'm clear that this is a group that has a can-do spirit and optimism and courage. That's what the banner says that greets you as you come up the stairs. And today, what we're doing is a call for action. It's a call for imagination. Technology, indeed, is one of the great equalizers. And it's one that has huge social impact. Digital technology transforms lives for billions of people, especially now after COVID. It offers help to manage an ever complex world. Now, technology also offers us incredible potential to accelerate economic growth, to facilitate the kind of new job creation that's under discussion here in practically every panel and also to fast-track access. UNFPA is working in 120 developing countries where the digital space is a gift. And as part of that, we hope to be able to keep marching forward towards the 17 Sustainable Development Goals 
we're halfway there to the year 2030. So as the United Nations Sexual and Reproductive Health Agency, it is part of our duty to become part of others' worlds and the movement towards sustainable development goal number five on full gender equality for women and girls is one of the top things on my agenda. The topic of the virtual being real and that violence can spill from the virtual context into real life is what brings me to want to speak with you today. Wherever gender-based violence occurs, it occurs because women, girls, young people, LGBTIQ people, disabled people, anyone who is labeled a minority or marginalized, their rights are being disrespected. This is an issue of rights because everyone has the right to live free from fear and free from harm. So right now, as it turns out, and the reason that I hope you can see I'm wearing a B in a circle for body right today, as it turns out, a corporate logo, a song, a book, copyright intellectual property receives greater protection online than human beings. We've created this B symbol within the circle akin to the copyright symbol precisely to drive home the message that when someone infringes on copyright, their legal statutes, policymakers know what to do. The judge knows what to do. But right now, the conversation that we would like to spark concerns how do we get digital platforms to take down objectionable content immediately, not after a process of days, months, years, or never. It's because governments have passed laws making copyright infringement illegal, and digital platforms devised ways to identify and prevent unauthorized theft and use of copyright material that the system works. So the body rights system needs to work. The reality is that people do also own their own body online, and the reality is that anyone who tries to exploit the image of another should uh, find that content deleted and the rights of the person protected. Many jobs right now are remote. And for girls' education, which is actually part of a girl coming through her adolescence, finding her womanhood, a lot of the information, a lot of the learning, a lot of the dialogues that she's involved in are online or on her phone. So the perilous nature of, rather than being a space of opening, uh, turning the web into a space of imp intimidation, demands our attention. If somewhere today, a girl wakes up and has this intimate photo issue that we saw, or if an adolescent girl is lured into meeting someone a lot older than her pretending in their profile to be someone else, or if you have a transgender teen being bullied and harassed online, then really that defeats the whole purpose of the web, which is, to me, at its best, the purpose of sharing information, sharing ideas, connection, and building community. And for women and for young people, I insist that the digital world has to be safe. So I'll just close because I think we're gonna have some interesting comments um, by saying that you can ask any female politician who's involved in a campaign. She understands exactly why we've got to get a handle on this issue. The violence that's perpetrated in a virtual space feels real. We're connected in that space, and the mental and psychosocial consequences are real and can be just as harmful as a physical assault. So again, thank you. UNFPA is very excited to be here with you at DLD because you're people who use your creativity, who aspire to the common good, and who really, I think, uh, share the values which the United Nations espouses, values of fairness of equity, of open dialogue, 
hopefully leading to that great big peace, which is still very elusive in our world. And I expect that the progress that we make here will usher in an era where ultimately peace on Earth will not be some fairy tale that we tell each other, but the actual experience that people live. So let's make sure we succeed. Thank you very much indeed. Danke schön. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. It was Thank wonderful, you. Natalia. Thank you. Yes, okay. So, together, my dear audience, we have to fight for our body rights. Don't you think Thank so? Thank you so much. Absolutely. It's so important. This message is really should go to your heart, to your screens, to your intellect. We needed you. We need you Sweet. to take action. Thank to, you. Thanks and so much. To go a little deeper, we have a panel now with first time on stage Katja Wildermuth, the Director General of the Bayerische Rundfunk, the Bavarian Broadcasting Operation. <laughs> Katja, thank you for coming. And we have Nicole Diekmann, Sweet. journalist and author. Thank you for coming, Nicole. And wonderful Tanit, whom you know her already. She's a great journalist, and she will ask good questions. <laughs> <laughs> Pressure is up. Yes. Pressure is on, of course. Thank you, of course. <clears throat> So, uh, a spoiler alert to start. Um, you may not have realized, but the title of this session is rather ambitious. And um, we're certainly not going to end online violence today. Certainly not in 20 minutes. I think if we had sort of seven minutes more, maybe it would work. <laughs> but um, to jump right in, Nicole, you, uh, you are a journalist. You wrote a book that was published last year. The title, uh, forgive my language, uh, is Die Shitstorm Republik, which doesn't need any translation, I think, into English. So you're an expert on the matter. Could you just tell us on the impact um, online violence has? The impact of online hate speech is, um, I think the main impact is the so-called silence, uh, silence effect, which um, leads especially women because they suffer online hate much more and in a much more brutal way than men do. It makes um, <clears throat> women um, withdraw from social media or um, become calm. They start um, to, to withdraw from, um, from issues, from discussions where they think it could, be, um, it could lead to harassment, to, to hate speech against them. They, um, they are really, really um, withdrawing from um, a more and more important sphere of democratic dialogue. So you're saying that men are also attacked, but it has a bigger impact on women because they, they withdraw? Well, um, studies are clear. Men, um, there's 50-50, 50% hate um, or violence against men, and 50% goes um, against women, but um, which is really clear is um, that the kind of hate that um, women suffer from is um, more dangerous because it's, um, people say 85% um, is punishable um, by law. All right. Katja Wildermund, you're a media executive. You're the chairperson of Bayerischer Rundfunk, the Bavarian public broadcaster. So you're well aware of um, changes in, in the media environment. In historical dimensions, going back to, let's say, the dinosaurs, I would always say that social media is about five minutes old. The metaverse is like five seconds old by comparison. And we already had cases of abuse and even virtual rape um, in that space. Do you think it's going to get worse before it's get better? It's getting better. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm a media person, but I'm not a prophet. <laughs> but um, <laughs> the question is, um, what can we do to prevent that? And I think the first thing, and I'm very thankful that you pointed it out that way, is just to underline that that public sphere is public sphere, no matter whether it's physical or whether it's digital. That's the first. Because it helps us to understand that, of course, as you said, it's an issue of rights. We have to keep conditions. We have to keep commitments. And, and I think if we go back historical into history, um, also into German history of the last century, we understand that, um, that a free 
and fair and respectful public sphere and the way how we get along with each other is nothing we can take for granted. So we need to have regulations. That's why traditional media also follows rules, follows self-commitments. And I think that's the, the main the main challenge is that, that platforms still deny to be publishing houses as well. So they just pretend to be tech companies, but they need we need to grab them at their responsibility, and that's what we need to do. Dr. Kanem, thank you for putting this not just on the DLD agenda, but also on the UN agenda. I do like the copyright comparison because it's very catchy, mm -hmm. copyright, body right. But when you say corporate logos and intellectual property music, etc., receives greater protection, isn't that also because it's so much easier to protect music, pictures, anything that is intellectual property? Um, when it comes to the sometimes subtleties of human aggression in, in verbal terms, it's more difficult to detect for the algorithm, isn't it? No, I would respectfully disagree with that. I think there is uh, abundant evidence. And in our survey, for example, we asked people, and the women and girls who were surveyed said, uh, in our sample, 40% of them who were users of the web said that they had been attacked, bullied, shamed, or felt, uh, you know, aggression online. And 85% of women said that they knew someone or it was themselves who had experienced this. So I don't really think that the uh, issues of piracy of music were that easy to resolve. I mean, there's years of legal precedent, there's discussion. And I think that's what's important for DLD because the same creativity, for example, um, recently the tracking disc that became popular, women immediately flagged, I'm being traced against my will. So I think the same creativity and the, and the genius that produces uh, the positive environment can also figure out how to regulate and dismantle things that amount to hate speech. Um, and ultimately, I think if you're assaulted physically, there's a whole body of jurisprudence that deals with that. So as we create new ways of relating to each other, the respect is not necessarily built in, but it can be. And I think that's what we're inviting people to consider. We'll come to the jurisprudence later. Before that, Nicole, in your book you say that the tech giants are relentlessly capitalizing on the mob that instills hate, misogyny, etc. So what, in your view, should be done to stop them? For instance, if we look for a technolog technological response, upload filters, stop end-to-end -end encryption, get rid of anonymity, um, you realize how controversial every single one of these proposals sure. will be. So what's your sure. take? I think um, the first step is mindset. It's, um, it's what Katja Wildermut just, um, just mentioned. Um, Facebook or Meta and Twitter and so on and whoever will pop up um, in the coming years must be clear about their responsibility they have. They are not just offering um, a technic infrastructure, but they are, they are responsible for, um, for a social climate. Poison, which is spread into social media, doesn't stay there. It, um, it hits all of us, if we are involved or if we are not. So I think this is the first thing, and um, it's the same the same uh, thing which I would, um, a, which is still a problem f um, we face when we um, deal with um, policy makers. There's still a lack of um, knowledge, this is the first thing, and there is a lack of um, power because tech um, giants like Facebook and others are so powerful right now. We need a supranational um, answer to all this hate. And I think it needs um, a supranational answer which consists of policymakers and of members of the tech um, firms, companies. Mm -hmm. It's not only this or this, it must be all together because um, no one right now is able to really um, fight this hate. It's too much. It has grown too fast during the years when no one really wanted or was able um, to, to really estimate how, how harmful and how serious this problem is. I'll 
I'll jump to the jurisprudence thing. As you see, we have no policymakers here on stage and no platform representatives either who would also say that it is in their own interest to have brand safety and not, not drive people out of their platforms because, yes, they want to capitalize on users and the user data, and they won't capitalize if people are driven out by hatred. But um, there's a famous case in Germany, which a lot of you will know, but some won't. Uh, a Green Party politician, well-known Renate Künast, um, tried to get an injunction against Facebook in a German court because she'd been slandered as a dirty pig, slut, and I won't repeat the worst that, was, that she was called. So interestingly, a Berlin court, which I think existed, uh, consisted of at least two women, decided that those remarks were bordering on defamatory and illegal, but were all in all um, okay within uh, free speech. It took another court to overrule that, and it took the Constitutional Court years later, just this, I think, January or February, to tell the other judges off and say, well, basically, you got it all wrong, try again. My question is, if well-trained German judges and half a dozen of them get it so wrong, how can we expect less trained personnel, staffers at Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, etc., to get it right? Well, the, the, I, as we don't have um, a representative of German judges here, and we don't <laughs> have politics here, and we don't have platform uh, people here, I think we should talk about our own responsibility, basically. So, um, and having said before, and I think you're completely right, uh, you are completely right that it's a matter of rights, it's a matter of, of regulations on one hand, I think it's also a matter of awareness on the other hand. It's not, and I don't mean only awareness by talking within this room where everyone agrees um, mm -hmm. on that topic. I mean, I mean awareness in, 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 in a broader sense, in, in, in really creating kind of a media legacy, so media legacy not only for, for children, but, but of course for the youth, but also for, for adults, for us. We need to, we need to be, to, to get the competence to, to, to not only operate our mobiles, but to judge what's in there and how it works and how the mechanism works. I think for most of the people, it's, it's still a miracle. And I think for, for us as, as media representatives, this is one of our main duties to, to create this awareness and how to use media and how to understand mechanisms. Because rules and rights and and going to court is always something that you can do after something happened. But we need to we need to make people competent and 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 knowing what what they see before things happen. So it ha they have to move in the digital world like the world like they move in the, in the in the in the physical world. Yes. And there's still a lack of knowledge and a lack of self confidence too. Okay. So follow up question for the three of you, two sort of journalists and uh, UN executive. Um, when we watched that testimonial, a thought sort of popped up in my mind. We, we saw the victim, we heard about the perpetrator, but for the victim, the virtual was real. For the perpetrator, it actually wasn't. So you just said, what, what can we all do? Would it be an option? I remember when I was working at Bild, German tabloid, uh, back in the refugee crisis, we uh, got in touch with um, some of the people we had identified that made racist, nasty, awful, comments on, on Facebook, not necessarily illegal, but nasty. Mm. And we confronted them with uh, a photographer and a reporter. And some apologized, some shouted at the reporters who came, some tried to sue the paper, sometimes successfully. So is, is that an answer to actually fight back by, if you have another testimonial, actually showing the guy who used revenge porn against his ex-girlfriend? Well, you know, because UNFPA works on sexual and reproductive health, young people are a prime focus for us. Yeah. And gamers, in particular, are people who have a sense of fairness. They understand the issue, but they're mainly men. One of the very exciting things that we did last year was to team up with BMW on a racing platform. It was a, a, a digital uh, worldwide platform. But the point is, the young woman that we saw was transformed from a victim to somebody who not only knows her own rights today, she was uh, inspired to advocate for other people. And I have put my trust in young people understanding their own rights. I think the fact is the perpetrators may have a host of even mental illness, as we see in this Buffalo case, where the virtual 
became real with murders of African Americans in the States. But the point is that if young women are aided by young men who interrupt this kind of behavior and make it not cool, that's going to reach a mass of people, hopefully more swiftly. So I think the normative behavior that we've been talking about is really making it clear that this is intolerable and that it will not be tolerated. I hear the music playing, but we actually started late. <laughs> um, about, I think, seven minutes, which was not that, Dr. Kahneman's fault. That's how journalists are, yeah. you know, they always <laughs> fight. She kept it very short. Um, <laughs> let me throw uh, another historical example at you. Um, Monica Lewinsky, uh, basically put through hell. The whole world knows her name, and that was before the age of social media. So. Um, what she said a couple of years ago is that, yes, social media, in her case, would have increased the hatred, but it could also have helped. Um, to quote her, she said, I think I would have heard some support from people, so it would have been a little more balanced. I think that when somebody sees mm. you and just acknowledges your humanity in the smallest way, it really can make a world of difference. It can save a life. So shouldn't we put more effort into what everyone in this room can do, and this is not legislators, not policymakers, exactly. etc. That's what I was trying to say. That's what we're all saying. Excellent. Yes, exactly. we're together. So we're all it's on the same not, page. I here. mean, yeah. that's that's exactly, and I think it's also in your book. It's not about avoiding these these places. It's not about escaping from social media, also as a traditional public uh, broadcaster, but it's going into that and shaping the discussion, and giving good examples how we can deal with each other in a in a respectful way. And at the very end, let me just. Yes, Definitely, sure. but let me add something. Of course, everyone, it's a question of civil courage. We should, um, we should keep up um, the good solidarity, which is, um, which is working all day. We shouldn't forget about the good sides <laughs> of social media. Of course, there are many aspects. I, I wouldn't have um, written a book with 300 pages if I, was, um, if I wasn't really, really in love and deeply love with social media because I see the really good potential it offers. But um, having said that and um, um, being really, really convinced of everyone's responsibility, we shouldn't forget, and um, this is really important, we should never forget the responsibility um, which is also, um, and I guess it's, for Alan, <laughs> it's, it's the tech companies and it's the policy makers. We all have to, we ha all have to, um, to live um, a life which is, um, which is responsible in a way and um, we should do that in social media too. But once again, um, policy makers and the tech companies, they have to do their homework. They didn't and they are they are in charge now. So just bringing Elon Musk at the very end of this yes. conversation. For example. Free, yes. Bringing Elon Musk in. <coughs> or actually not, because the, the controversy with freedom of speech um, and do I feel offended or not has been going on for a while. Quite frankly, I am equally concerned about the aggression as women, uh, against women, vulnerable groups, as you've been, been talking about, as I am that someone like J.K. Rowling is receiving a lot of hatred for voicing her opinion. And she's a prominent person voicing her opinion. There are less prominent ones who've lost jobs over exerting their right to free speech. So the silencing effect we just talked about can actually work both ways, can't it? Well, the point is that dialogue is not always going to be smooth and easy. And the purpose of the web, and I think that's the noble purpose of the web, is to allow people to share information to correct misinformation. So ultimately, I think you can have any type of debate, but when it deteriorates into attacks, threats of rape, people being stalked and uh, doxxed and outed, this now crosses the line. So to me, it doesn't matter what the topic is. Everybody deserves their respect and their human rights, and we all need to be vociferous about this. I think for a lot of us, it's uncomfortable. You know, it's weird, you don't want to get involved. But we are involved, and my biggest concern is for girls to be able to learn online without being fat shamed or brutalized or whatever it is. Okay. So I think there are probably literally millions of examples, but we also need to bring forward the examples of where and when this changed. 
And this was one small example that we presented in the video. It was. On this note, I was about to end, but I think you have one. <laughs> no, I think, I think um, yes, yes, we're, we're we are running late. late. So <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Too. Lots of food for thought. Much. We'll continue this conversation and offline and hear more do. food for thought. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.